Well, thank you for introducing me as old reliable. Uh, Steve and Rick, I'd like to congratulate you on your outstanding success for this conference, as well as the IMEDICS people and the other people in the CCFA. It's really quite impressive how well things have been coming along. So I guess, yes, we should have moved to Orlando. So uh, my disclosures are probably somewhere. Just presume that anything I talk about there is a potential conflict of interest. I do want to note that although this is a CME program, brand name drugs typically are not used, but in this presentation they're necessary for some cases because mesalamines often will have the same generic name, but as I'm going to show you, there's different delivery systems and also the same is true with budesonide. So if you, the CME police are here, please be aware. <clears throat> so for the mesalamine agents, we, can, we use the term mesalamine, it's really mesalamine, balsalazide, olsalazine, sulfosalazine first created by Dr. Nanus Fartz in 1940, FDA approved for ulcerative colitis, off-label in Crohn's disease, safe and effective in mild to moderate disease. All my slides, by the way, are in the, in the handout. I got my presentation in on time, so you can kick back. Uh, so what do you need to know about choosing the right mesalamine, um, know where they release, know if the patient's had them before, combination therapy, adequate dose and compliance. We're going to go through each of those. So know where your patient has their disease. You did the colonoscopy. Where do they have disease? And where do you need the mesalamine to release? These are the release sites. Again, you have these slides. They are branded names, as I explained before. And you can understand that while it's off-label, if you happen to have small bowel Crohn's disease and you choose to use mesalamine, then your choice would be either the first two, the pentazo or prezo variations, while if you're more towards the colon side, you're going to do a pH 7 release, the Delzaqual, Azaqual, HD, Lealda, or the azobon, azolfenine, dipentum, colazol, giazo. Patients who have distal disease may need an enema, the rawasa, or suppository canasa. Try to say that faster than me. Previous experience with mesalamine, ask the patients what, what happened. Were they intolerant to specific mesalamines? Were they intolerant to the same mesalamine? So there's the same coding on Azacol HD, or I guess now it's called Delzacol. <laughs> See, I have to change my slide again. We companies stop buying each other out. Um, the same coding on Delzacol, uh, Azacol HD, and Lealda. So if they're intolerant to one, probably not a good idea to try one of the, those. Um, uh, balsalazide, some people are intolerant to balsalazide, so don't give a different balsalazide formulation. Are they intolerant to all mesalamines? As some patients may be, and sometimes it even extends to the topical mesalamine. So if they tell you that every time they go on the mesalamine type agent, they get worse, believe them. Um, combination therapy, meaning from oral and rectal, is superior, as we've been seen many times. Studies in left-sided ulcerative colitis have shown patients in red have combo, enema and oral. Patients in black have just enema, and patients in blue have oral. And I think you can see, even from the back of the room, the red bars are the tallest. <laughs> so if you have someone on oral mesalamine who ain't doing that well for ulcerative colitis, particularly left-sided, add a topical therapy. Usually the reason why patients don't take topical therapies is because the doctors never prescribe them. They're not going to get them on their own. Same thing with maintenance ulcerative colitis, left-sided disease. If this patient had pa uh, this study had patients with ulcerative colitis were in remission for a month, but it had relapsed twice within the past year. On the left-hand side, you can see if they got oral and topical therapies, their relapse rate was only 39%. But if you just gave them oral agents, their relapse rate was 72%. So some patients need to stay on topical therapies. Even if you go to some of the more advanced therapies that Gary's going to talk about after me, some patients need to stay on topical therapies at least twice a week. And then pick the adequate dose. Um, with oral mesalamine agents, there is little evidence in active ulcerative colitis that there is a dose response beyond 2.4 grams a day for patients with mild disease or mild to moderate disease. These are different studies. Uh, the partial response is red. The complete response is blue. You can see that whether they get 2.4 or 4.8 grams, uh, the study, the bars are essentially the same across uh, these studies. Um, this is studies with um, uh, the multi-matrix uh, version of mesalamine, and you can see that whether they get in the blue bars 2.4 grams a day or in the light blue bars 4.8 grams a day, the efficacy is about the same. However, there is data that in moderately severe ulcerative colitis, there might be a dose response, and probably is a dose response for greater than 2.4 grams a day. 
Um, these were the Ascend trials, and you can see that in blue you have 2.4 grams a day, in purple you have 4.8 grams a day, and in at least two of the three trials, the purple bars are higher than the blue bars. So patients who ain't getting better with 2.4 grams go to 4.8 grams, and usually you want to keep them there. But I would say that if you should probably tell them to stay there because they're probably not going to do it anyway, but then at least they'll only go down to 2.4 grams <laughs> rather than going lower. Well, we can talk about that during the question answer period. And then compliance. Um, Susie Kane's famous graph showed she took Steve Hanauer's patients who were on mesalamine in remission and she followed their pharmacy data. <laughs> and these patients knew she, was following their pharmacy, knew she was following their pharmacy data. And you can see the patients in green line who stayed on most of their mesalamine stayed in remission. And the people on the orange line who were taking most of their mesalamine ended up relapsing within two years. Half of them, over half of them relapsed. So these are the easiest patients typically to keep in remission, and that's why even the easy patients, just tell them to stay on the mesalamine. So those were the summaries for mesalamine. Um, simplify your dose regimens to increase compliance and better outcomes. As you know, there are some once a day dosed, some twice a day dose regimens. Some people feel that once patients are well, they could probably dose them all once a day, although that's not on label for all the therapies. Um, but certainly try to make your regimens easy. Antibiotics in IBD, there isn't that much on this. Um, it's usually mostly in Crohn's disease. The data in UC isn't very strong. If you look on the left-hand side, there's an antibiotic action that's proposed. Maybe we're decreasing bacterial lumen concentrations, selectively eliminating certain subsets. Maybe that's why ciprofloxacin and metronidazole seem to work so well for our patients. Decreasing tissue invasion, decreasing microabscesses, decreasing bacterial translocation and dissemination. And then there are some IBD-specific factors. Think about it. Someone has a stricture in their bowel, they're not going to be washing the bacteria through. Maybe you need to decrease that overgrowth. Um, if they've had surgery, that, they can also have problems with motility of their bowel, loss of the ileocecal valve, the magic valve. Um, uh, subsets have uh, 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 antibiotics have shown different, uh, uh, patients have shown differing severity of colitis, different types of uh, uh, bacteria can cause different severities of colitis, particularly in mouse models. Um, Crohn's and severe UC can penetrate deeper into the tissue and then have other sequelae of actual fistulous disease. Uh, as I mentioned, ciprofloxacin is well tolerated. Side effects are very rare. Most patients only get side effects of ciprofloxacin when they read the package insert. Um, I'll keep it at that. Uh, metronidazole, unfortunately, while it is cheap, does not, you don't have to read the package in search to get the side effects of metronidazole. Neuropathy uh, can be a big problem in long term use, um, so we generally don't use metronidazole long term. Tinidazole may be uh, better tolerated. Rifaximin data is somewhat here, somewhat there. Um, probably the most intriguing thing about antibiotics is what Paul Rueckert's group showed many years ago. In 95, patients who had Crohn's disease, who had a curative resection, well, the Crohn's comes back, right? But if you put them on metronidazole for three months, if you look um, uh, at the yellow bars, that's the metronidazole, high dose, versus the purple placebo, you can see that particularly severe recurrence on the left-hand side of the graph at three months was only 13% if they were on the metronidazole versus 43%. Uh, on placebo, but they couldn't tolerate the metronidazole past three months, and you can see as you move out to one, two, and three years on the right-hand side of the slide, the patients start relapsing more, too. He, his group subsequently tried ornitazole, which is not available in the United States, better tolerated, and still, while they're on therapy, up to two, up to 12 months on the left-hand side of the slide, the yellow bar people on ornitazole had lower endoscopic recurrence rates. And on the right-hand side, the clinical recurrence at one year, 12 months, 37% versus 8%. That's great, but they stopped after one year, and then they started catching up. So there is a potential role of antibiotics in patients with IBD. Certainly Crohn's disease. Ulcerative colitis, not so clear. Um, metronidazole had mixed data. Ciprofloxacin has had mixed beta data. There was one study that said, well, they're on steroids. It seemed to work. Rifaximin is uncontrolled data for the most part. Now, pouchitis is a different, different story. If you have a patient with pouchitis, first-line therapy are antibiotics, simply ciprofloxacin or metronidazole, um, cipro pref preferably because of the side effect profile. Um, and uh, there is some data, although weak, with rifaximin. So moving right along to corticosteroids, again, I know I'm going rather fast, but these slides aren't that complex, and you have them all in front of you, and we have to catch up for 
little bit of time, which is what my role is here. So IBD steroids, um, just if you can remember one thing from my lecture, it's if you have a patient on steroids, your goal in life is to get them off steroids once you've gotten them well, okay? And if you can't get them off steroids, consider yourself a failure, okay? Really, consider yourself a failure. I'm not gonna say you're a failure, especially if you're bigger than me, but consider yourself a failure because really, steroids, if you're gonna use them at all, really should only be short term. And when you write a prescription for a steroid, if you write prescriptions anymore, you are actually writing a prescription for two medicines, the steroid to get them well and something else to keep them well. And that is for most patients um, with, with IBD. Obviously, steroids work fast. They work fast, particularly in patients who are very sick. And if you're steroid naive, steroids were great the first time, pretty good the second time, third time, we're not quite sure, so we'll give you a one pass, maybe two. But you see the little clock animated, I guess it stopped moving on the top, your clock is ticking. Um, unlike medicines that may have side effects, steroids will have side effects, short term as well as long term, as you know, um, any of you who had to <clears throat> recertify for the boards clearly knows that they'll ask you a laundry list things, and uh, you also, again, can't stop people abruptly. You have to wean them off. Oh, there's the clock's moving again. I don't know. With, maybe I wasn't moving. Um, you can give steroids through any orifice or route on the body. They do get people well, inducing remission, but they do not maintain remission. In fact, there's been no study showing after one year that any steroid is better than placebo in keeping people well. Um, this study uh, suggested that on the left-hand side, about half of patients with Crohn's will respond to steroids within a month, but on the right-hand side, you can see that one year out, um, either 20% are refractory and 36% are dependent, so 56% are either still on steroids or they ain't working with ulcerative colitis. 54 plus 30, 84% have at least some response to steroids within a month, but at one year, half of the people are either at surgery or stuck on steroids, and you're talking about surgery. So steroids are short-term, first time, maybe second time, but no more. So steroids, as you know, have had some um, advances. The, the ones up to, up to this point, prednisone, prednisolone, hydrocortisone, et cetera, are a shotgun, uh, unfocused release throughout the body. We're looking more now at new school focused release um, at sites of inflammation, and what's available to us in the market is budesonide. Budesonide is actually very potent, uh, but it's targeted delivery to the bowel. We now have two FDA approved formulations the budesonide CIR, which is the um, entoquart version, which releases at pH 5.5 to 6 in the small bowel in the right colon, and the budesonide MMX, the Eucerus version, which is a pH 7 multi-matrix release, which is pretty much colon only. They undergo extensive first-pass metabolism in the liver, so as a result, there is there's usually no or minimal steroid side effects. The Crohn's version, um, controlled release, you can look on the right-hand side of the slide. This is where the absorption is of the budesonide, and it's all before the ileum or in the ileum or the, or the ascending colon. As a result, if you have Crohn's of the small bowel or right colon, this is your drug. Uh, the MMX formulation, which is FDA approved for ulcerative colitis, although it, some people you may use it off-label for Crohn's of the colon, oh, I'm sorry, um, uh, uh, is a pH 7 release, so it's not appropriate for releasing the small bowel Crohn's. This was just data from two different uh, big studies, the US and, and European study. If you look in each graph, the right-hand bar, the tallest one, that's the dose uh, that we use for the budesonide MMX. And you can see um, the European study did also have the Crohn's version in their UC study, um, the second bar, the nine milligrams of budesonide CIR, you see it is not as effective. So one the very nice thing about budesonide versus traditional steroids is if you look at this style, uh, slide looking at bone mass preservation, uh, the light blue is the budesonide CIR, so the small bowel release. You can see that the bone density actually barely changes, statistically it doesn't change, while patients on prednisolone in yellow, um, bone density plummets. And it's all within the first few months of use. In fact, if we broke down those first six months, it's either mostly within the first one month of use. So if you know how to spell the word budesonide or the brand names, if you're gonna write the word prednisone on a prescription pad, write budesonide instead. The excuse that, oh, maybe the insurance won't cover it, maybe this and that too, 
deal with that if that has to happen. But you should not be writing the word prednisone unless you know for a fact that the budesonide is not going to be effective or in the particular patient's case that they can't get it covered. There are other instances where you'll need to use prednisone, but the vast majority of patients who I see have never even been tried on uh, budesonide, and it's a real crime when they walk into my office with faces, moonlight faces, et cetera, too. So, again, my role in these meetings is always to catch people up. In summary, mesalamines match your drug with the disease location. Combination therapy, don't forget, even if patients, some may need to stay on combination therapy. Antibiotics for Crohn's disease, certainly a role in fistulizing disease, perhaps in luminal disease, and post-op prevention alone or maybe in combination. Uh, in UC, there's really much, there's really no data, good data in UC, except pouchitis, as we talked about. For steroids, short-term only, even with budesonide, try to get them on something else. Use budesonide rather than conventional steroids, if possible. And then, as Susie Kane would always uh, tell us to emphasize, compliance is key. The medicines don't work if patients don't take them.